that record is made from trash. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it... There's one Coldplay album that's literally trash. Not in the way people talk about music, but actual trash. Plastic pieces collected from rivers and oceans. From that waste, Coldplay created Moon Music, the world's first album pressed from recycled ocean plastic off the coast of Guatemala. From offshore cleanup missions to coastal recycling plants, a new cycle of rebirth is underway, where waste is cleaned, sorted, and transformed into useful materials. In this video, join the factor in to explore how ocean waste is being recycled and given a second life. Every year, more than 20 million tons of waste are swept into the ocean, and nearly 80% of it is plastic, a material so durable it can survive for centuries underwater. These fragments not only form massive garbage islands, but also infiltrate the food chain, affecting over 700 marine species and eventually humans. According to environmental organizations, if properly collected and recycled, much of this ocean waste could be reborn as valuable raw material. From recycled plastics and synthetic fibers for the textile industry to reclaimed metals. This process not only saves thousands of kilowatt hours of electricity and reduces millions of tons of CO2 emissions, but also paves the way for a circular ocean economy where everything once discarded can return to serve a new purpose. The journey of recycling ocean waste begins with collection. And to gather such massive amounts of debris in a harsh environment like the open sea, countries must deploy specialized technology systems. In large accumulation zones, such as the North Pacific Gyre or the Gulf of Thailand, dedicated cleanup vessels are the main force. Two hydraulic mechanical arms extend from both sides of each ship, sweeping the water's surface in a fan-shaped motion to capture floating debris. From plastic bottles and nylon bags to abandoned fishing nets, the waste is guided into floating conveyor channels connected to the vessel, then transferred to stainless steel belts on the deck. There, the material is funneled into large storage compartments. A single cleanup mission can last 8 to 10 hours, collecting up to 5 to 10 tons of mixed waste. Not all debris drifts far into the ocean. A significant portion becomes trapped in rivers, reservoirs, and canals, where it forms thick layers that block water flow. In these areas, compact mechanical equipment is used, most commonly clamshell excavators mounted on dump trucks. Each steel clamshell, weighing nearly 1,000 pounds, can reach deep into the water and scoop up mixed waste, bottles, plastic bags, branches, and even old tires. Every lift can haul between 500 and 1,000 pounds of trash. Thanks to mechanical power, a single team can clean a river section hundreds of feet long in just a few hours about 10 times faster than manual labor. However, in many coastal areas, collection still relies on local fishermen and volunteers, using small nets and hooks from boats under the blazing sun. Each person can recover only a few hundred pounds of waste per day, yet their work marks the indispensable first step in the ocean's recycling cycle. Once the collection phase is complete, the waste is transported to port by trash skimmer boats, specialized vessels designed specifically to collect floating debris. A small skimmer boat, about 25 to 30 feet long, can gather about five tons of waste during an eight-hour shift. When full, its hydraulic conveyor at the bow lifts and unloads all the waste into the receiving area on shore. Here, the initial sorting process officially begins. The freshly unloaded mix contains a wide range of materials, plastic, metal, wood, seaweed, and organic sludge. Workers perform a quick check to remove large or hazardous objects such as steel nets, oil boys, and tires. The remaining waste is then scooped onto a feed conveyor, which carries it into the screening section. Inside the sorting area, a trommel screen separates waste by size, sand, mud, shells, and small debris fall through the mesh while bottles and packaging remain. The remaining fraction, mostly plastic and nylon, is sent down a manual sorting belt, where workers separate each material group in preparation for the next stage of the recycling process. 
After thorough sorting, materials such as metal, glass, and wood are directed toward their respective treatment lines. Meanwhile, plastic, the most durable yet troublesome material on the planet, is retained to begin its journey of rebirth. Join the factor in as we explore how humans transform drifting marine waste into recyclable resources that fuel a more sustainable future. After sorting, the recyclable portion of the waste, primarily plastic, nylon, and metal cans, is transferred to the washing section. This stage is crucial before recycling, as marine waste is often soaked in salt water for long periods, coated with algae, oil, and microorganisms. Inside the treatment area, the waste enters a mechanical washing tank. Rotating shafts fitted with paddles create swirling motion to peel off surface residues and flush away contaminants. The wash water contains mild detergents and a salt neutralizing solution to remove chlorides and oil. Some plants use hot water between 160 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit to enhance sterilization efficiency. The process lasts between 15 and 30 minutes, depending on how contaminated the waste is. The clean materials then pass through a drum washer which rotates while spraying high-pressure water jets to remove stubborn sand and algae. Next, a float sink tank separates plastics by density, peat sinks, while HDPE and PP float. This ensures accurate classification before recycling. Finally, the washed waste moves to a centrifugal dryer to remove residual moisture, followed by hot air drying at about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger facilities add ozone deodorizing systems to treat steam emissions and eliminate organic odors and bacteria. After the collected plastic waste is gathered at the facility, the first stage in the recycling line is pre-sorting, separating plastics by type and size in preparation for deeper processing. There are seven types of plastic commonly used worldwide, but PET and HDPE are the two most effectively recyclable. Therefore, the entire system focuses on isolating these two types while removing incompatible materials. The mixed plastic stream enters a large rotary steel drum. As the drum rotates, small holes allow dust, sand, and small fragments to fall through, while larger bottles continue forward. This step provides coarse size separation, preventing clogging in later stages. Next, the waste passes along a manual sorting conveyor where workers remove unwanted items such as metal cans, nylon, and cardboard. At the same time, an automatic cap and label separator uses Vortex Air Force to detach different plastic components. Magnetic sensors scan continuously, ejecting any remaining metal fragments or staples. After this mechanical filtering stage, the remaining material consists mainly of clean, uniform PET bottles, now ready for the grinding process that follows. The plastic bottle bodies are then fed into a high-speed granulator. Inside, hundreds of alloy blades rotate at thousands of revolutions per minute, shredding the bottles into small fragments known as flakes. Each hour, a single machine can process between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds of plastic, turning a mountain of bottles into a continuous stream of uniform material within minutes. The flakes, measuring only a few inches across, are small enough to pass through the next thermal treatment systems without clogging. This grinding process not only reduces volume, but also improves energy efficiency in the subsequent stages. Once the plastic is finally shredded, it melts faster inside the extrusion machine, saving up to 40% of electricity compared with melting solid plastic blocks. It also serves as the first size control stage, ensuring the material is uniform before entering the next phase of precision sorting. At the microscopic level, optical cameras take over. High-speed sensors scan each individual flake, analyzing its color, transparency, and surface texture within just a few thousandths of a second. When the system identifies a clear PET flake, a green PET flake, a white HDPE piece, or a foreign material such as wood or glass, a burst of precisely targeted compressed air ejects it from the main flow. A single machine can process more than a thousand fragments per second, 
achieving an accuracy rate above 95%. Each air pulse acts on just one fragment weighing less than one thousandth of an ounce, without disturbing the surrounding material. The result is a stream of pure, homogeneous plastic flakes, perfectly sorted into separate groups, forming the foundation for the pelletizing stage that follows. The qualified plastic flakes are fed into a massive extrusion machine. Under a temperature of about 520 degrees Fahrenheit, the plastic melts and travels along a giant rotating screw shaft. The increasing pressure forces the molten stream through an ultra-fine metal filter, trapping any remaining impurities. The purified plastic melt is then pushed through an underwater pelletizer, where it is instantly cut into millions of tiny particles known as pellets. A closed-loop water cooling system solidifies the pellets immediately, ensuring a uniform size and smooth surface finish. These pellets are now industrial-grade raw material, ready to be used for manufacturing packaging, synthetic fibers, or even blown into brand new bottles, completing the cycle from waste to resource. From the recycled pet plastic pellets, the factory begins the preform molding stage, the creation of the semi-finished form that will later become a complete bottle. The material is inspected for quality, then fed into an injection molding machine heated to around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. The softened plastic flows into a steel mold, forming a thick-walled tube with a threaded neck already shaped for the cap. Each preform is built to withstand both heat and pressure, ensuring stability during transport and the later reheating process for blow molding. Its compact size allows for efficient storage and logistics. Many factories specialize solely in producing preforms, then ship them to bottling facilities near consumer markets, where they are reheated and blown into finished bottles. In the next stage, the preforms are heated until they reach a soft, flexible state, then fed into a stretch blow molding machine. Compressed air at high pressure is injected through the neck, expanding the softened plastic and pressing it tightly against the inner walls of a metal mold shaped like the desired bottle. A preform measuring about four to five inches in height expands to nearly four to five times its original size after blow molding. Each automated production line can manufacture thousands of bottles within seconds, with an error margin close to zero. Laser sensors continuously inspect wall thickness, roundness, and clarity to ensure consistent quality. Beyond standard shapes, the system can customize capacity, body curves, and label placement according to each brand's design requirements. After this stage, a fully formed PET bottle is complete ready for cooling, capping, and packaging. When leaving the mold, the bottle body remains at a high temperature and is easily deformed. Therefore, the production line immediately transfers the bottles through a rapid cooling chamber using either cold air or circulating water. This process lasts only a few seconds but is enough to stabilize the structure and preserve the shape. Some modern factories recover the heat released from the bottles to reheat the cooling water, significantly reducing energy consumption. Once the plastic has fully hardened, the bottle reaches the required mechanical strength to withstand pressure during filling and transportation. The cooling rate is precisely calculated to balance production speed while maintaining the bottle's optimal clarity and rigidity. Before leaving the factory, every plastic bottle must undergo strict quality inspection Optical sensors, cameras, and pressure measuring systems detect even the smallest defects, from cracks and air bubbles to dimensional deviations. Some samples are taken for mechanical tests such as tension, compression, and impact to ensure structural durability. For bottles intended for food use, additional chemical analyses verify that no toxic residues remain. Only after meeting all criteria are the bottles grouped, stacked onto pallets, and shrink-wrapped for protection. Automatic palletizing robots organize thousands of units with precision down to the inch, labeling each batch with a unique traceability code. From the central warehouse, the products are transported to beverage plants, supermarkets, or retail outlets, 
completing the rebirth journey of recycled plastic. Every new bottle produced is not just a consumer item, but the result of a circular technology chain, where waste is transformed into a reusable resource for the modern world. From lifeless fragments of plastic drifting across the ocean, humanity has created an entirely new life cycle, where waste is recovered, cleaned, reborn, and returned to the world as something useful. Every water bottle, every fiber, every plastic item you hold might once have been part of the sea. Recycling is more than a story of technology. It's proof of our ability to turn what was once discarded into a symbol of responsibility and creativity. The ocean still waits to regain its original blue, and that journey begins with the awareness of each of us. If you believe recycling can change the future, leave a like, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe to The Factorin to discover more inspiring stories of renewal and transformation.